hello to everyone who's joined today and welcome to this seminar, which is part of a series of seminars hosted by the Cambridge Public Health Early Career Researcher Network. At the end of Dolly's presentation today, there'll be some QR codes shown on the screen where you can find out more information about the network and how to join. So today we have Dr. Dolly Tice, who is a visiting researcher at Cambridge's MRC Epidemiology Unit, where she completed her PhD, which examined UK government obesity policy. And alongside her visiting researcher role, she is currently a policy consultant focused on facilitating the progression of government policy, particularly on child health and food. And today's talk, she'll be discussing what it is like working in government policymaking, particularly focusing on public health, what kind of roles there are and how to get them. She'll discuss the difference between politics and policy and what they both mean for public health. She'll give a quick history of government policy in England on obesity to demonstrate why and how government policy does not necessarily lead to problems being solved, provide a deep dive example of how government public health policies are actually made in practice. So Dolly, over to you. Thank you so much, Jack, and thanks to the team for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, as uh, Jack set out, um, I am going to be talking about getting involved in public health policy and uh, politics um, and covering these three uh, main areas and, and really look forward to getting into the discussion. I'm going to try and get through the presentation fairly uh, efficiently so that we can really um, get uh, kind of step into the detail during the discussion based on your questions. Um, but I'll briefly cover the idea of working in government policy, the sort of diverse um, range of options there are out there. Um, uh, the difference between policy and politics, which is often something not um, hugely discussed, uh, and then giving a bit of an example based on the research that I did uh, for my PhD around um, why government policy doesn't quite um, often solve uh, the problems that it sets out to and, and how our policies actually made um, in practice. Um, I just thought as a bit of a background, uh, it would be helpful to um, say a bit about where I have come from myself and which might help to explain sort of where the position that I've ended up in now. Um, but prior to uh, coming to this very glamorous um, building on the right <laughs> to do my MPhil, converting to epidemiology and public health uh, back in 2017 now, um, and then followed uh, by my PhD, I spent um, about 10 years uh, volunteering and working in around uh, Westminster, um, starting during my teenage years while I was at school, um, volunteering on political campaigns uh, for specific candidates, um, one of which, one of whom was um, a person who is now in the House of Lords, um, who has been a government minister, uh, Zach Goldsmith, and he, uh, I helped uh, for a number of years on his campaign to get him uh, into Parliament uh, as an MP, which he was for several years before going into the Lords. And that was very much driven by an issue um, focused uh, reason. I was interested in his um, focus on environmental issues and particularly around food. So that theme has absolutely stayed with me for um, my whole uh, career and work in, in the world of politics and policy. Um, I then ended up working in Parliament itself in the House of Lords as a researcher and balancing that with working for a peer who, um, uh, alongside her work on, on various issues, which included food waste. So again, food came back into that um, back as a focus into my work. She also ran a campaign that helped women get elected and selected um, in uh, politics. So I was very focused on um, helping women become MPs in particular, but also um, getting elected to different levels of government, such as local councils. So that was my work for a long period of time. And then I ended up, after I finished my undergraduate degree, um, I ended up working, uh, running uh, an MP's re-election campaign because I was interested in how election campaigns run, um, how do you win uh, and what goes on uh, in them. I, I found it an absolutely fascinating area to be in and um, happy to answer any questions about that if that's of interest. And then after that, I ended up in a think tank. And that was really what took me to doing uh, the sort of MPhil and converting to epidemiology and public health and then on to my work um, in um, uh, as a PhD student and then my policy consultancy work. But it was at a think tank in Westminster, which I could talk a bit more about what they are, but they're essentially research units. Um, they're often uh, tied in some way to a political leaning. Um, so you'll get ones that are quite strongly on the left or right of politics. You'll get some that are much more neutral 
that uh, are sort of more scientific, I guess, in a way of the way they do things. Um, and I was in one that was sort of on the center right um, of the political spectrum, very much focused on poverty and issues of social justice. And they hadn't really done anything in health, particularly before. They'd done bits on mental health because there's such a strong link with mental health and um, issues related to poverty. Um, but there was a lot of news at the time, this is 2015, 16, a lot of news at the time about the link between deprivation and childhood obesity. So they sort of said, you know, we really should be doing something about it. And that was when I thought, oh my gosh, this is um, something that brings all my interests together, particularly around food systems, but also this social issue. Everyone had something to say about obesity, um, that it was sort of so politically contentious and of, of great interest to the public. And so I ended up leading that work there, only to realize that lots of people in government policy don't actually know the evidence um, or are not necessarily basing their decisions on the evidence. And so I was then really interested in going of, well, if I'm seeing that, um, what can I do to, to be able to equip to find out more? And it was uh, Professor Dame Carol Black, who was on my working group, who at the time was principal of Newnham College, at Cambridge and has been president of Royal College of Physicians and a big person in government policy. And she said, well, why don't you go and, um, and do the MPhil at, at Cambridge in, in public health and epidemiology? And so, you know, if Professor Dame Carol Black tells you to do that, then off you go. And um, I ended up in it. And, um, and now I'm really looking at applying my research to help facilitate the government policy making process around a range of issues, but largely to do with health. So in terms of working in government policy, um, I tend to encourage anyone who asks me, um, you know, what they should uh, consider. Um, oh, let me see if I can go back. Um, I tend to uh, ask them to sort of be creative about it and let and, and go and find out, you know, it's often quite hard to know based on just searching for roles out there. It's much better to get stuck into speaking to people, getting involved in something um, and then seeing where it takes you and getting involved in, in other organizations and stuff like this, whether it's voluntary um, uh, ones or, or whatever you can that really expand your network and, and uh, what options are available available out there because it's often so hard to just do that behind a desk but giving you a kind of broad um idea of the options out there sorry I just couldn't see the end of it so within government there are the kind of obvious you know civil service roles which are often very well advertised and you can usually find out about them quite easily so going to the obvious departments if you're interested in public health with it obviously sits within um the department of health itself and you've got the various other bodies around it like the office for um health disparities um and uh, there are you know even the food standards agency for example you could go beyond into other organizations like that that are related but it really depends on your interest um but i would say that there are many many roles that are fascinating within the department itself and then to think about public health as being across all government departments so if there's something that you're interested in whether it's related to criminal justice for example then not to restrict yourself to thinking of just public health as a department of health based um, uh, kind of issue and to know that there are jobs across the whole of uh, government that really have a public health foundation to them. You've then got the more, and for that, uh, you're not supposed to be sort of politically affiliated. You're supposed to work with any government um, regardless of party. And um, there are restrictions in terms of the political activities that you um, can be, uh, you can do and be doing at the time. The more sort of political roles uh, include special advisors. Um, and again, very happy to answer any questions in particular about that role. But special advisors, very interesting within government policy because they do tend to hold a lot of power. Um, they tend to be people who, uh, I mean, it's so interesting because I've been talking to lots of the ones that are in at the moment about where they come from. And a lot of them come from sort of consultancies or they've been parliamentary staffers. So they've worked for MPs in Parliament. Um, a lot of them come from think tanks. Think tanks tend to be very well networked within government um, and particularly with government ministers and, and politicians who end up getting appointed to be government ministers. So then they get taken up with them. And those special advisors will follow, tend to follow a particular person around government. So for example, if you're Jeremy Hunt and you were the Department of Health um, 
Uh, you were Secretary of State for the Department of Health, and then you get reappointed. Uh, you're now Chancellor. Your special advisors, your main advisors, won't be people who are necessarily particularly expert in those fields of public health, for example, or health. They will um, be your advisors politically and policy based across um, everything. So sort of expected to have a general knowledge and they will move with you um, to be special advisor in whatever department you're appointed to if you move around. So that's sort of a slightly more unusual um, role than, than people tend to, to realize. But you can find out a lot about um, sort of who they are. I'll show a, a sheet of, of where you can find out about who are the special advisors in each role. But a, a minister, for example, will tend to have a policy advisor. So they're expected to really know their stuff about what policies the government is doing or what they're wanting to do on that given area. You'll have a political advisor who's there to really um, uh, navigate, how, help navigate the politics of given issues, which we, we will talk about more uh, in a bit. And then you'll have a comms uh, advisor who helps uh, deal with all of the public facing <laughs> work and managing any news stories and all the stuff that you'll see uh, throughout the news uh, when it comes to these uh, sorts of issues. There are also public appointments, so you can apply, they're all advertised, you can apply to public appointments and they are sort of chair or board roles of public bodies. Uh, and there are lots that are highly relevant if you're uh, within public health, highly relevant to public health. And then within parliament, you could go and be a, a staffer to an MP, um, which is advertised on work for MP. I'll show um, in a couple of slides. Or there are parliamentary organisations that are relevant. So research-based organisation like POST, which is the Parliamentary Office for Science and Technology, that might be more of interest than working for, for uh, a single MP. But again, an MP will also have different roles within their office. They'll have someone who's dealing much more with constituency matters. Um, so people coming forward with issues around visas or housing conditions or whatever, and you're having to navigate all of those. Um, and one that tends to do much more of the parliamentary work. Um, so if a, a, an MP, for example, has a particular interest, um, then they'll be facilitating that work within parliament, writing debates, for example, speeches for debates or media articles or anything like that, or briefing them about given issues. Um, so there tends to be a division of those roles. And then if you're interested in pursuing the research based uh, positions within government policymaking, then you could go to a think tank uh, like I did. And there are many, many think tanks. There are some think tanks that are very specialized and focused on a given area, or there are think tanks that will look at all sorts of areas. As I said, and as I said earlier, uh, which is you if you Google sort of think tanks and their political leading leanings, this is quite well written about, but you can find out where a think tank tends to sit on the political spectrum. You'll have one like the Center for Policy Studies, which is quite far on the sort of right and affiliates itself with a sort of Thatcherist view um, of the way the economy uh, works and the government, what role the government should play. And that comes with a kind of political position, which obviously, if you completely disagree with, <laughs> might prevent um, your chances of getting um, getting getting a job uh, more. Um, but these are all the fascinating things to consider. And then there are, as I said before, more neutral ones. You could also think about working for an NGO or charity, um, an organization that's particularly focused on a given issue. I work in my consultancy work. I work a lot with organizations across NGOs, charities, etc. cetera. Um, for example, Food Foundation or which is a charity uh, focused on food issues, Sustain, another charity focused on food issues across both um, environmental and uh, health issues, and lots and lots of others, foundations as well. And then, of course, there are professional bodies, um, for example, the Royal Colleges, um, and they tend to get involved in quite a lot of research. They'll put out um, uh, reports, for example, on childhood obesity, which they have done throughout the years. Um, or there's obviously industry itself, if you were interested in going down that. I should have also put that consultancy is another area. So if you go and work for the McKinsey's, they'll be working with major organizations, including the government. Um, McKinsey is a big one for the government, a big consultancy working with the government. Um, and you can do, you can end up doing research um, massively as part of a job like that. You can also work for similar to the same types of organizations, but on the advocacy side, and there being a distinction between the sort of research and the advocacy the advocacy you're moving much more into pushing for certain policies 
Um, and again, I work with a lot of organizations that do that. So the Obesity Health Alliance is an alliance of almost uh, 70 organizations such as uh, Cancer Research UK, British Heart Foundation, the Royal Colleges, uh, lots of the big charities. And they, as a body representing all of those, will put out, for example, a manifesto pushing for certain policies. And they will be advocating as much as they can, working with whoever they need to, to try and push for policy change in that area. Um, and again, you'll have industry pushing for certain policies or pushing against certain policies or the introductions of, of certain regulations, for example. And then that's another um, that's another position uh, you could be in. And then within comms, you again could be working for a lot of these organizations within a comms um, uh, position, very much looking at how to communicate the evidence, which is obviously a vital role because so much evidence is produced, which is just not even read, uh, let alone picked up and translated um, into uh, effective policy design and and you know integrating that within the in within the policy making process. And so that comms role, I can't emphasize enough of how important it is. And I'm working a lot with framing organizations like the Frameworks Institute at the moment to really understand how we can most effectively communicate evidence so that it aligns with the way that certain people view the world. So if you're with a government at the moment who views the world as it works, if the government has less of a role, how are you going to communicate evidence that shows that government um, would be able to tackle certain issues if it plays a bigger role? How are you going to communicate that in a way without the person rejecting it completely? And that's at the moment, that's a really, really interesting piece of my work of trying to navigate um, different views of the world and making it more acceptable and appealing for people that may otherwise just reject evidence if it sounds like it just doesn't fit with their worldview. Um, and then I've also put in political parties that if any of you are politically active or interested in being politically active, then political parties have a whole hub of ways that you can get involved that do end up translating into government policy because obviously parties end up forming governments. And so there are many either policy or research um, roles within political parties. So you could be actively um, involved in the development of, for example, a manifesto, manifesto commitments, and those do end up often translating into real policy change. Or there are voluntary roles if you wanted to get involved in party political or cross party. I'm involved massively in a, in a cross party campaign that helps women get elected and selected, which I co-founded after my work in parliament, helping women get elected. And and that's really interesting because you've got essentially these people coming in interested in becoming MPs uh, who one day might be ministers. And I've seen many make that journey from absolutely having nothing to do with the world of politics and policy to being government ministers responsible for government policy. And the more that you can see that role and be part of that um, progress, it can be a fascinating one. But there are obviously tensions within remaining neutral and being able to uh, withhold that when it comes to scientific research and having party political positions. That's something again I've had many fascinating conversations with over the years um what to know about Westminster is that within that flow of uh of jobs you've got a lot of revolving doors so you'll have people that again as I said have been in think tanks then they go into government and they'll come back out and then they'll set up something else or they'll be part of something else so you never quite know where anyone's going to end up but it is a fascinating world to be in that once you're sort of inside the revolving doorness of where people uh, how much sort of people stay within Westminster is is uh, really interesting and you've got a lot of people that go from oh, that person worked in a, in a in a think tank or a, an organization NGO charity for so long and then suddenly they're the MP for so and so and then maybe suddenly they're the minister for a given area so um it's always wise to not underestimate where people are gonna end up um this is the uh website which i mentioned so guido forks is very is a sort of very um political um uh, comms platform and they publish uh, all the details of the special advisors in government at a given time. So you can go and look at the entire spreadsheet. And I was just giving some examples of the ones particularly powerful at the moment when it comes to government policy on public health. You've got uh, the Deputy Chief of Staff on policy, um, 
Will Tanner, so effectively he's the head of the Prime Minister's policy unit. He ran a think tank um, before and he's been in the sort of world of Westminster many times. And only last um, September, we were organizing events on public health in for, for the Conservative Party conference. And that was where we got some commitments from government ministers on issues related to uh, public health, particularly on school food. Um, and then suddenly he gets appointed uh, the, the Prime Minister's um, policy uh, director. And so this kind of opportunity of how much people can move into that. And hopefully, um, if he's been exposed to some of the evidence around public health, he'll be thinking more um, about the evidence when it comes to the public health policy side of things. And then you've got Bill Morgan here, who is the specific health advisor to the Prime Minister. Um, he, as far as I um, understand, is very much a kind of NHS man, not so much on, on public health. Um, but then you've got further down the list, if you check out the website you'll see for the Department of Health who the specific special advisors are and it's always interesting seeing their backgrounds you know do they come from a health background as I said before SPADs are not always experts within their given field um, and they often don't stay in that department if the minister then changes um, and I always find that a very very interesting part of the way that Westminster works. So here's how to find out more about jobs you've got w4 mp so work for mp that advertises much more than just uh, working for mps and um, they advertise you'll have a lot of organizations that advertise job positions through this within westminster so if you're interested in a policy position it's definitely worth going to check that out the guardian jobs is often very good for uh, policy roles uh, particularly with an organization so even just narrowing down your search to policy roles you can find out linkedin is obviously a great place um, for people posting I know that a lot of people within sort of government policy and um, and Westminster use LinkedIn a lot for advertising their jobs. And then, as I mentioned before, public appointments, which is often something a lot of people don't think about applying for, but you can go and see what public appointment positions are, are open to apply for. They tend to be senior. So, um, you know, this isn't a kind of junior research based thing, but it's a, I, I always think it's important, even if you're starting your career, to know about all of these different positions and, and to sort of understand how they all link and what roles they play. So then moving uh, quickly on to the difference between policy and politics and the implications of that for government policy making. So these are two different words. And in other languages, including many of the Romance languages, the word for policy and politics is the same. So I find it really interesting that in English, they're, they're two separate words. And the policy, the official definition of it is a course or general plan of action to be adopted by government party person, etc. And they're sort of statements of the government's position, intent or action. So if the government pu pushes out a, a strategy and it says we will do X, we will introduce a new screening program, for example, that counts as a government policy. And then the politics is the activities associated with running the government um, uh, or country, especially the debate between parties having power. So the, really the politics of a given issue, you know, is it feasible? Is it acceptable? What does what is expected of a given party um, uh, in terms of what position they take on an issue? You know, do they play a big role in the way that the government um, acts and the responsibility it takes to certain issues? Or is it known as a party that takes a, a much more reduced role and these are the sorts of differences that you'll get um, in that and they affect even if you have a policy that seemed to be very effective the politics of it can often bring uh, uh, a whole load of other questions into the mix so giving an example a recent example of the politics and what it means for public health um I want to start with Wes Streeting here, who's the shadow, Labour shadow health secretary of state. And Labour, the Labour Party is often considered by organisations and individuals working in public health as a party that's more amenable to public health interventions and a kind of greater role for government when it comes to public health. And yet when we were in that September 2022 uh, situation, which is when the parties have their annual conferences and it's where the parties sort of meet to talk about their visions and ideas and stuff. And we were doing lots of events um, on uh, public health issues, largely around food and, and um, dietary health at both the Labour and Conservative Party conferences. We were sort of frustrated with the fact that we're streeting 
um, was was being very resistant about um, sort of committing to any uh, expansion or congratulating the kind of uh, soft drinks industry levy and talking about particularly the um, restrictions on fast foods, on healthy food promotions that the government was looking at pushing through at that time, although um, uh, a lot of these have been delayed since that time. But he didn't want to be seen as putting the prices up for consumers and making things more expensive for consumers, even though we the evidence is out there that, that that's not necessarily the case with this. And in fact, we know that promotions like two for one offers on unhealthy products actually increase what people spend because they're there, to, they're designed there to be impulse purchases. So this was a political statement. This is about him not wanting to be seen as increasing the cost, even though it doesn't, it can be hard to communicate that. So he's sort of sitting on the side of wanting to be seen with down with the people and, and uh, concerned for their pockets. Um, and at the same time, he didn't want to be seen as taxing uh, government, uh, taxing business, sorry, unnecessarily. And so there was a hesitance about talking about the expansion of the SDIL or introducing any other similar fiscal taxes. So even with someone who is from a party where we would think that there's uh, more acceptability, there's still these sort of political issues of not wanting to be seen to be increasing people's expenditure, which happens whenever we talk about food policy, even when the evidence doesn't, um, doesn't support that or shows the opposite. And then Liz Truss, when she was coming in um, uh, to be prime minister and on her leadership bid campaign, she really put public health intervention and scrapping them at uh, the forefront of her campaign saying, you know, she would be promising to get rid of this sort of unnecessary nanny state interference. And so it was a highly political issue that it doesn't matter about what the evidence shows and the reality of the policy, the politics of it is that you've got people who will support someone who's seen to be kind of reducing state interference um, and not telling them the public what they should and shouldn't be eating, which is what a lot of um, particularly food policy is, is seen at. So these are the, this is the kind of politics of these given issues. But in terms of the actual policy um, development side, I use the SDIL, the soft drinks industry levy, as a really good example of, very, of a very carefully designed policy. Um, and there are big questions raised around it now um, on, you know, does it, has it actually improved health and how do you um, design policies that actually improve health? If you just look at it through the reduction in sugar, does that take into account all of the potential side effects of people switching to other products or, um, or increasing what they eat um, in terms of unhealthy food on other things, those sorts of things. But it was a very cleverly designed policy that was focused on getting industry to reformulate their products rather than increasing the price of, um, of the items, which is exactly where the politics comes in uh, into it. But these are the kind of differences of when you've got something very cleverly designed from a policy perspective that can be just taken up and, um, and brought into a lot of political issues. Um, I'm going to try and be quick. I know, Jack, I'm I'm running over. So in this last uh, few bits, I'll try and go through the research side on, on government policy. So what is the point? I basically came to my PhD going, what is po government policy? If it's not there to solve a problem because we're not seeing many problems solved and yet lots of policies are proposed, then what's happening? So I was really trying to think about what is the point of government policy from a government position? Is it to solve a problem? Is it to send a political or ideological signal or message to sort of gain power, stay in power? Is it appear to be doing something just to stay in power? There's a kind of cynical aspect or is it a bit of all of these? Um, I looked in particular at obesity policy in England and um, it analysed all government obesity policy to date between uh, the early 90s and the last government obesity strategy to be published, which was in 2020 under Boris Johnson, which is still the one being, um, well, sort of implemented, but really delayed and, <laughs> and some parts scrapped altogether by the current government. Um, so there have been 30 years of government policy, 14 strategies within that time, seven of which are broader public health strategies, seven which are obesity specific strategies, and within them contain 689 individual policies and yet no reduction as these lines show, no reduction in adult obesity or child obesity in that time. So why is that? So we're on this policy merry-go-round. 
um, with policies and strategies published again and again, but nothing actually happening. And so I did a deep dive into one um, strategy uh, of how it came about and to find that I, uh, it was like a game of snakes and ladders. You sort of, if you look at things chronologically of what happens, uh, you have these huge moments of progress only for something to happen and it's all delayed or scrapped or whatever, or, you know, the government changes and you've got a new person in, which is exactly what happened. Theresa May came in um, and she was handed this draft uh, childhood obesity strategy, which had been developed under David Cameron. And she came in and essentially the government went, what a load of nanny state nonsense. And they scrapped quite a lot of it. And, uh, but not the soft drinks industry levy, which was kept in. Only two years later to then publish a, a second chapter of the childhood obesity plan with almost exactly the same policies that they'd taken out <laughs> before, after sort of reading, getting deep into the evidence and understanding actually that needs to happen. This kind of policy action needs to happen if they're going to um, really make some change. And then we've had a few more since then. Um, this is just the, timeline and prime ministers over the last um over the last uh eight years um on uh the the original draft under david cameron that was handed over to theresa may who then took out most of the policies and published a childhood obesity plan with really the soft drinks industry levy at the fall followed by these two other chapters that was sort of showed some learning and realization that you needed strong government policy but then she left boris johnson came in he almost scrapped all of them, um, only to get COVID himself and realise that actually government intervention was really needed because he talked about how his own weight was a reason why he fared so badly with COVID. And so he published a government um, uh, obesity strategy, which was almost torn to shreds by Liz Truss, um, although she left just before that decision was really made. And it's been handed over to Rishi Sunak, who uh, big old question mark about progress on it. We've had lots of delays um, to some of the decisions that were supposed to some of the policies that were supposed to be implemented by now. They've been delayed, so we don't really know what's going to happen. So that's a kind of very rapid overview of um, the world of Westminster and government policy making and the opportunities there. It's a lot to cover. So I'm sort of going to try and move on to the Q&A and um, be able to answer your questions much more um, uh, in detail uh, based on what you're interested in hearing more about. But thank you so much. And I can put up the, or is that helpful at the end? Uh, we can come back to that after the questions, yeah. And I'll highlight right. that. But yeah, thank you very much, Dolly, for an insightful talk. Um, Please feel free to pop in the chat or raise your hand should you have any questions. I thought I'd start off with um, asking you to maybe elaborate on how kind of research in a policy or consultancy kind of setting might differ from academic research that most of us are more familiar with. How it differs? Yeah. It's a really interesting question. I mean, it's it's almost impossible to answer because so many organisations and positions will differ when it comes to that. And it's the same in a way of if you're in different um, positions within a, in a university, whether it's different departments or, you know, they won't always be exactly the same. But there's definitely... I felt, and this was partly the reason why I ended up in, uh, but going back to academia, that it just wasn't as rigorous and there wasn't a really clear structure to how to conduct research that sort of made me feel confident <laughs> that um, you were absolutely delivering the best. So, um, and then on top of it, the politics of these issues can end up forming and providing quite a basis of what research is done at all. Um, I had a very interesting recent conversation with someone in a leading think tank who wanted to do more on research in the think tank on, on prevention and, and sort of prevention within health and was being sort of held back by colleagues who were just not interested in mm. that at all, didn't see it as being relevant to, you know, the think tank's position or the way that they view things or what's important. So, that kind of um, experience, and I had that when I was doing my report uh, on childhood obesity at my think tank, um, there were there was sort of decisions made about specific policy recommendations that were just so not based on the evidence, but they were based more on sort of not wanting to be too provocative, not wanting to upset, you know, people or not just disregarding it as, oh, surely that's not going to work. 
um, rather than basing it on that. So I just found that whole experience absolutely fascinating. And unfortunately, that is how a lot of government policy making is conducted. Um, and so understanding, which is why I really emphasize the importance of communication, because if you feel that you have done and are doing really important research and people are not responding to it or understanding it there is something in the communication gap that needs to be addressed and so understanding how politics works understanding what motivates whoever else you're having to work with in it whether it's civil servants or ministers or MPs or whoever or people who work in think tanks understanding motivation understanding why people are there what they're interested in and seeing how you can translate your evidence and research into um, practice is a fascinatingly important area. Yeah, great. Thorough right answer. Very good. Uh, let's see if anyone's popping up. Uh, so we've got a question from Catherine Mendez. She asks, currently, are there any restrictions on using food colouring or preservatives in foods and beverages? I, that is a very specific <laughs> question. I don't know the exact regulations around food coloring and preservatives, but I know that it, as a as a broad area, um, having looked increasingly into regulations around specific ingredients, that it is an absolute uh, minefield. And there are lots of almost completely unregulated ingredients that are used in very common foods. So I think it would be a fascinating one to go and find out exactly what the situation is on it. if anyone else got any other questions here so a medical student who's interested yep. in public health particularly prevention of chronic diseases my question is do you work with doctors at all and what roles do you see them playing in influencing health policy development it's a really interesting question so in my policy consultancy work i basically work with whoever i can and is interested in in um sort of facilitating meaningful policy change when it comes in particular as i as jack said to child health and food um uh, and particularly i mean this stems from the kind of area of dietary public health uh, in particular and we absolutely work with um doctors as i mentioned you've got a lot of uh, medical bodies that will play roles so like the royal college of physicians the Royal College of Child Health and Pediatrics, these sorts of um, medical professional bodies will often play some kind of role in policy development. Um, and then you can also have doctors who um, are sort of independent campaigners on certain issues. Uh, for example, I've got, uh, I'm working with a group of people who are interested in improving food in hospitals. Um, a few of them are doctors who are literally working in hospitals and uh, one issue is on provision of food 24-7, of hot food 24-7, so you haven't got staff relying on vending machine food. Um, and the other side is the nutrient quality of the food actually served for both patients and uh, staff members. And so we're really trying to understand how uh, we can get meaningful policy change so that food in, in public buildings so, and, and through public um, services are, uh, is a very high quality uh, standard. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to get <laughs> policy change on that area. Um, money is often a big, big issue and big companies that are uh, have been brought in for years to look after the food in these sorts of um, uh, places are not necessarily ones that prioritise health. <laughs> but get involved if you're interested and, and then I'm sure the Royal Colleges would be a great place to start if you're if you're um, keen to do so. Um, so what a bit of experience in policy, wanted to ask your advice around the best place to start whilst doing a postdoc. For example, I heard about a programme called A Week in Parliament. Do you know if that's still happening? Or would you advise to start somewhere else? Yeah, so, so interesting. I should have included actually a lot of the, there is so much on offer in university institutions around getting involved in policy. And um, for example, CSAP, the Centre for Science and Policy has a lot of events and programmes. And CUSP is another one that runs certain courses and events and stuff. So um, understanding, kind of figuring out where the key um, places are within the university. For example, if you're all in Cambridge, then the Bennett Policy Institute, which was founded not that long ago, I know has a lot of events and um, and things available. And colleges also have 
um, uh, courses and stuff available. I, I was at Jesus College and the Intellectual Forum runs um, various uh, summer courses of getting more involved in, in policy. But people are always there, I, I found, if you're if you're sort of asking around and sending out emails for wanting to know about what's on offer, people are always there available to give um, advice. But I would start with those organisations. A week in Parliament sounds amazing. <laughs> Um, and just to get involved and start contacting people um, as much as possible. Um, I, it's obviously harder when you're trying to balance things with um, the work that you're doing. Um, but I just think charities, organisations, attending events is just such a great place to start. They're always doing stuff and you can always meet people um, uh, there and to see how you can sort of get involved in the process. Yeah, I know the Food Foundation used to host events in Parliament quite often, didn't they? I remember when I was a, during my undergraduate degree, I attended a few of those and, you know, good to just get in there, see what kind of people are there, get the different perspectives of, you know, the MPs and you know, the government and the opposition MPs and then bouncing off each other. Like events like that are really good at getting some experience with that. Totally, totally. And the select committee, so the, um, in in parliament you've got um you've got these committees that are there to hold the departments to account so they're called select committees and you've got them in the house of commons so where the mps are and the house of lords as well uh where um appointed members uh sit and uh, these committees tend to be very influential when it comes to holding the government to account. And they're a great source of information about where the government's at with certain policy issues. So, for example, the Health and Social Care Select Committee, which is there to hold the Health and Social Care um, Department to account, is currently conducting, has just actually recently launched a massive inquiry into health prevention across a whole range of issues. So Yasmin as well on chronic diseases, they'll be looking into that. Um, and they host uh, evidence sessions with um, you know, whether it's the chief executive of NHS England, the Secretary of State, uh, major academics, campaigners, Jamie Oliver, for example, has, has attended quite a lot of um, select committee events in the past. And they're really interesting ways to learn about what the government is doing on a given issue. And you can actually go and watch those sessions in Parliament if you're interested in seeing the action in person um, or they have live streaming on Parliament TV. But there's all the information about what's going on, um, as well as other organisations called all party parliamentary groups that tend to be interested in specific issues. They'll also run events. So just going, getting used to going to Westminster, going to Parliament, going to think tank events going to charity events, for example, on the issues that you find most interesting, there is just no question that you will um, inevitably get more involved and find out more about what's available by doing so. And you can also reach out to your MP locally and see whether they um, do work experience and whether they would have you in to, you know, come and shadow their team for a, a day, a week or whatever, or something like that. It's very worth uh, getting in touch with people that way. Yeah, definitely. And I think also, so I was fortunate enough to work in the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities for a few months last summer. And so I worked in the kind of research team within that organisation. And they have loads of like little bits of research projects, research ideas that they want somebody to do that they don't necessarily have the capacity for. And it could even be a few hours kind of projects doing a brief bit of evidence synthesising or summarising that is really useful to them and puts you in contact with the people helping to develop and inform evidence-based policy as well. So yeah, just finding the bits of the government departments as well that are really relevant and interesting to you, I think can also be really useful. How did you get, get into doing that? Because that's a really, I never did that. And I know other colleagues who, who found it amazing. Yeah, so because I, my PhD is funded by the Medical Research Council, it was through the UKRI. So through on their initiatives where they fund PhD students um, to go into government organisations to do this more kind of policy focused research um, and policy development kind of work. I'm not sure what exists for people at kind of other career stages or later in the early career research stage, but I'm sure there's opportunities out there still. Really, really interesting. Um, we've got a question from Catherine and then Isaac uh, has a hand up. So uh, Catherine, I'm a nurse practitioner in the US. Is there such a position in the UK or is it only physicians that can prescribe medications? I That is not a question I know the answer to, I'm afraid, <laughs> Catherine. I don't know if anyone else on the call knows the answer and they can put it in uh, the chat, for example. Um, uh, or to raise their hand and, and ask, um, but 
I would be very interested to hear the answer. Uh, well, I, yeah, if Isaac, if you want to, if you can unmute or if somebody can unmute you and you want to ask your question. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Great. So my question, I'm a PhD student in uh, public health when it comes to cancer research. And obviously when you're doing academic research, the emphasis is on public and on getting everything published that you can, making it all open access. I was wondering if there's a similar emphasis when you're doing research for the government or whether it's kept more in-house. In terms of publishing evidence and publishing what you've researched? Yes. Oh, it's such a good question. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of stuff is, it depends what you're talking about. You'll get a lot of briefing, internal briefing notes. So say you're working for a government department, for example, you'll get a lot of internal briefing notes that you'll have to do in internal reports and stuff that might not end up being published. Um, but because you've got this um, sort of dynamic, structural dynamic of holding government to account on this stuff, a lot, there is a lot of expectation of um, government departments publishing the evidence upon which they base their decisions. So you'll have a select committee, for example, that will ask about um, will ask for certain bits of evidence to be to be published. And just as a kind of example of what you can find, um, there's a, a, a major independent review of the UK food system that um, it was conducted by a, a chap called Henry Dimbleby, which was published in 2021. And I spent a lot of, I spent 2022, a lot of the end of 2021 and 22, working with him to try and get the policy recommendations in that independent review taken up by government. And we're still working on it to this day. But because it, the government commissioned that independent review of the food system, it then committed to publishing a response to it. And it went, it published its own strategy, but it went back to all of the, things set out, the evidence set out and responded to that. And you'll often have that even with the select committee if they publish a report about a given issue, which we're likely to see with this prevention um, uh, inquiry and a big focus is on, on cancer and other chronic conditions. So I would I would very much look into that, but they will eventually likely publish a report, whether that's broken down by the different areas or have one big one. And there will be an expectation that the government has to respond to each part of it. And part of that is about um, publishing what their evidence base is and how they're making decisions, et cetera. Same with government um, strategies themselves. They'll have, uh, they should be putting the evidence upon which they're based, but it is not always clear and it's not always clear um, how evidence is put together, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a really interesting question because it basically totally depends on what you're talking about. All I would do is that if you're, if there's something that's published on a given area or there's a policy that's being put out there or has already been put out there on a given area that you're interested in, trying to trace, you know, what the government has published on that is, is a fascinating exercise. And I'm sure you would learn a lot as I have done doing exactly that on, on the areas that I'm particularly focused on. Wonderful, thank you very much. Pleasure. Great. Does anybody, anyone else have any more questions for Dolly? I mean, I can I can chuck one your way, Jack. Just a bit more about your experience of working in government, because obviously we chatted about yeah. it when you were when you were doing it. But it's yeah. I found it fascinating what your experience involved and what you actually saw from the reality of government policy making. So maybe it's helpful. Yeah, I think uh, my experiences were it's a messy process, and even being aware that it's a messy process, it's messier than what you can expect until you're in that kind of situation, right? And kind of what I asked you about the difference between research and academia versus research in that kind of setting. The timelines and the focuses and the priorities are all very different. It's all much more responsive and much more fast paced. But sometimes the asks for the research come from a policymaker, right? So sometimes the kind of director of uh, the department would be like, oh, I need an evidence synthesis on this. And I'd be like, yeah, OK, great. When do you need it by? And they'd be like, oh, in an hour and a half's time. And in academia, right, you know, we write systematic reviews, they can take a couple of years to publish. So then to kind of change tack and go into that kind of setting. Um, yeah, it was very different, very different kind of skill set to work on. And it's the trade off right between the rigor that you talked about in some of the settings you've worked in before and after academia um, versus that kind of setting. 
And then also how much departments, even when you're just kind of a, a general civil servant, how much the ministerial changes and the political changes at the top do have an impact. So whilst I was at OHID was when we had a change of uh, Minister of uh, Health and Social Care and how that knocked on to our work was actually really interesting because certain things paused right and then certain other projects and areas of work kind of continued as normal. Um, but then we had like big government documents, obviously the health disparities white paper was meant to be the big paper that was going to help kind of fix ideally a lot of our kind of problems in terms of health inequalities in England especially and then so I can look at some of the evidence synthesis for that and then obviously it's never seen the light of day as of yet and it probably won't in its former form right it's going to get chopped up into different bits um, so yeah that's an interesting process but you share the frustrations of other people in politics right because you do a lot of work on something and then it can just get canned in a moment yeah I mean it's interesting because there's a your short term your um what you say about the kind of short termism and you can end up in this very responsive cycle mm -hmm. at the same time the this is why i sort of love the policy uh, process theories um in academia and i would highly encourage anyone who's interested in understanding more about the poli uh, policy process to look at the theories that are out there um there's a very famous one uh, that was sort of created in the 80s called the multiple streams framework um or multiple streams theory uh, based on the American policy making process, but sort of applicable to many other contexts. And um, that has this, it has a notion of these three streams that are always um, occurring within government policy making. And you've got the political and the policy. And the policy development side is the idea that it doesn't matter what's happening in politics, whether, you know, you've got someone in government and someone, um, you know, current government comes in and it's totally not interested in your area and you sort of have to wait it out. The policy development can still happen and is still happening during that time. And having worked on the same policy area now for so many years and seen that change in government and the politics, you know, coming and going, the importance of using time itself to refine and strengthen and develop the policy ideas that you have and sort of not necessarily falling only into the reactive which can be so easy within that although it's much um, easier said than done so having time in academia where you're literally given the capacity to think deeply over long periods of time I just think is the most phenomenal um, background to have in order to then go into government policy making because you sort of can see above all of the noise and the short term changes and see with clarity sort of the sorts of things that need to be done um, and need to uh, all the, the times in which a, a quick change is good and how to yeah. capitalize on that. Yeah, yeah. Great. Oh, another... oh, yes. So for someone who doesn't know doesn't yet know very much about public health policy, how would you recommend getting started and building foundational knowledge? It's a really good question. I mean, policy is a funny thing because so many people don't feel very confident about um, knowing what it is. <laughs> and, you know, a lot, a lot of people, even in politics, politics or academia, which tend to feed absolutely into policy, um, feel can often feel uncomfortable with saying, oh, I just don't know anything about policy. Um, policy is essentially, as I said, by definition, it's the sort of ideas, um, whether you're talking about government policy, it's the ideas of how a government thinks it should solve an issue or run the country or do things, conduct things. So it's just their way of solving certain um, uh, issues and managing um, certain, uh, certain issues. And I'm careful to use the word issues because saying problems, for example, is a, an interpretation. If you've got low unemployment, you might see that as a problem or not. Uh, sorry, high unemployment, you might see that as a problem or not a, a, an issue at all, because you might end up saying, well, actually, it matters more about the quality of employment. So understanding that the world is full of certain issues and different people see those issues as problems or not uh, as problems, depending. And then the policy is often a response to that, either to maintain things or to change things. And so when it comes to public health, I would really start by thinking about what it is that you're interested in. Are you interested in 
Um, you were saying that, uh, Yasmin, that you're interested in, in chronic diseases. So what is it about that? Is it that you see the um, there are certain chronic diseases that are out there that are preventable? And what can you do or what can be done to prevent people from getting them? And what sort of role does government play in that? And then I would look into the sorts of potentially reports that um, have been published on those given areas. Definitely look at the charities that are campaigning on the sorts of conditions that you're uh, most interested and see what they're putting out there get an idea of the sorts of debate happening around the issues that you're interested in and you'll start to sort of understand oh this is what the organizations are saying needs to be done about this given issue um and then potentially learn what the government's position is and then start thinking well if you were in charge um if you were in government what do you think should be done about that given issue and starting to think about why you think that uh, and why uh, the government currently would be doing what it's doing, why other people might think differently to it. And that is essentially you're entering the world of public health policy. You're thinking about how issues should be addressed, what's needed, what resources needed, who needs to be involved, and ultimately what role government should play in that versus all the other um, people and organisations in the world, uh, the healthcare services, community services, et cetera, et cetera, what role they play in that um, uh, and just treat it as a, it don't, I just think it's so important not to feel embarrassed or uh, afraid of sort of not knowing anything or not feeling like you know anything. Just asking these sorts of questions is so uh, important. You wouldn't be surprised with how many people, uh, you would be surprised with how many people in government don't, <laughs> don't really know if you ask them what government policy is, uh, what it is and feel not confident in it. So uh, you, will, you will not be alone in starting that very, very exciting journey. Um, right, great. I think we need to wrap up now. If that's okay, but thank you very much, Dolly, for your time today and your very thorough presentation about um, government policy making and the various roles that we can look into um, for future. If you could just move on to the final slide for me. Yeah. Great. So here is some information about our upcoming um, seminar. So this one is in person on Wednesday, the 19th of April at the School of Clinical Medicine based at the Biomedical Campus. And this is our, on how to succeed in obtaining research funding tips for public health researchers. And there's various different speakers from different aspects of the kind of um, research funding process for this. And then on the final slide, I think there are the QR codes that I mentioned at the start. So on here, you can find various bits of information about the early career network, how to join the mailing list, and actually how to become a member of Cambridge Public Health. Um, but thank you for everybody for joining today and hopefully see you at our next seminar in April.